Morning San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It is Tuesday, December 14th. We started off very foggy this morning. It's kind of hanging around still, and I'm seeing a few droplets on a couple of trans guide lenses around town. We're going to talk to Justin, and Stephen is here with a traffic update. That is coming up. But for now, let's look at today's 9 at 9. The first two known cases of the COVID Omicron variant have been detected in Bear County. The cases were discovered through genome testing at UT Health San Antonio. Health officials say the samples were collected from patients on November 27th and December 7th. Workers, volunteers, and members of the National Guard are spreading across tornado damaged areas of Kentucky to help with recovery tasks, large and small. The tornado outbreak Friday killed at least 88 people in five states. 74 of them were in Kentucky. President Biden plans to survey the damage tomorrow. The House panel investigating the January 6th Capitol insurrection has voted to pursue contempt charges against former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. The House is expected to vote today to refer the charges to the Justice Department, which will decide whether to prosecute the former Republican congressman. Derek Chauvin is expected to change his plea to guilty in the federal civil rights case against him tomorrow. The former Minneapolis police officer is accused of depriving George Floyd's right to be free from unreasonable seizure. Back in June, he was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison after he was convicted on state murder charges of killing Floyd. The parents of a Michigan teen suspected in a deadly school shooting are expected in court today for a probable cause hearing. James and Jennifer Crumbly each faced four counts of involuntary manslaughter and have pleaded not guilty. The Boy Scouts of America announcing a tentative settlement plan to compensate survivors of sexual abuse. The organizations involved agree to pay $850 million. The plan still needs court approval. A multi-million dollar settlement has been reached for the victims of Larry Nasser, the former Olympic doctor convicted of sexually abusing girls for decades. This is the second for his victims. Nasser is currently serving a 60-year sentence in federal prison on child pornography charges. COVID cases on the rise among children. Yesterday, the American Academy of Pediatrics reported that new COVID cases reported among children last week were up nearly 24% of the previous week. Airlines say the Omicron variant could limit holiday travel. Industry officials say it will not be clear how much travel has been affected until after the busy holiday season. December 23rd and January 3rd are expected to be the busiest. And that's today's 9 at 9. We are helping those impacted by those devastating tornadoes. Our KSAC community partners, along with the Red Cross, will be hosting a phone bank tomorrow. That's from noon to 7 p.m. on December 15th. We will be releasing the phone number to call tomorrow, so make sure to keep it on KSA and KSA.com for more information on how you can donate. Well, Mike Osterhedge said earlier the fog was going to hang around a while. Here we are at 9.01, and Justin takes the baton with an update on the fog. I still think we have at least another hour here of low visibility here around San Antonio, and I... I think that the, the fog's you know, pretty widespread here, so it's going to take some time for this fog to lift. And once it does, we're still going to be left with cloud cover, so it's still going to be sort of a gray, murky day. Let's go outside for you, and that's the scene we're looking at. Visibility is down around Bear County and up towards Kerrville, New Braunfels, Hondo, Pleasanton. As I mentioned, this is fairly widespread fog. We do have a dense fog advisory in effect that goes until 10 a.m., and then you look at the uh, satellite picture, there are some, uh, well, a lot of clouds, but there are some showers as you get down towards Victoria and Beeville. Those are moving north, generally pretty light. We'll stay east of San Antonio, but you could see some showers there east of town. As far as the pollen count is concerned, everything's low. Molds are low. Mountain cedar shows back up today, but it's in the low category at 70. And uh, temperature wise, we're in the 60s. It's a warm start. We'll get into the mid 70s this afternoon, despite the cloud cover. So warm and humid really all week long. And there's the forecast 75 your high temperature today. East southeast chilly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. A lot of heat and humidity. We could be challenging some records by the end of the work week before our big cold front comes. We'll talk more about that seven day forecast here in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Well, it's just not been a great morning out there. Tuesday morning traffic has been riddled with troubles. Let's go ahead and take a look at Trans Guy 37 at Hot Wheels. You can see that it's uh, almost pretty difficult to make out exactly what's going on there, but we can definitely definitely see traffic moving in a lot of these shots. And in other shots, we're seeing some problems. Let's take you right to the map and show you what we're talking about here. Now, this crash we talked about a little bit earlier that was detected around I-10 at the Y. Uh, however, a new crash just popped up here off I-35 southbound just past Martin. You can see that. 
in these southbound lanes. We're starting to see a red buildup of traffic, so make sure that you plan accordingly. If you travel through that area, be prepared to slow down. Taking a jump up here, we have a pretty serious crash off 281 southbound at Isom Road. However, not seeing so much of a buildup right in that area, but make sure that you watch out for those first responders who are working to clear the scene. And taking a jump up here, a nasty crash off 1604 eastbound at Hebner Road, causing some delays, but the westbound lanes were also seeing a little bit of a slowdown as well. While it's unclear if that fog brought many of these problems, as we take a look at our road weather map, as Justin mentioned, we do see a lot of that in our area and a lot of red, so it's looking a little bit too colorful on our map just for, for this Tuesday morning. So again, make sure that you're driving carefully out there. 281 at Grayson we will continue to watch the roads closely and give you all the updates on air and online. Stephanie. Thank you, Stephen. Top stories we're following today. An argument turns violent on the northwest side overnight. It's happened just before midnight off Wurzbach, right near I-10. And that's where police say two men began fighting when one of them pulled out a knife. Police say the other man grabbed the knife, cutting his hand. He was treated on the scene. The man who pulled the knife was arrested and could face assault charges. San Antonio police investigating a possible case of a vehicle burglary that led to a shooting. And just before three this morning, a man went outside his house and saw three men trying to break into his vehicle. When he confronted them, the suspects fired several shots, hitting the man in the leg and grazing his back. Even though EMS workers believe one of the bullets may still be lodged in the victim's leg, he refused to go to the hospital. The suspects took off in a red older mo model sedan with a black bumper before officers got there. In your morning headlines, we have more from Kentucky on the destruction from those deadly tornadoes. We'll hear from one of the many heroes. And an Amazon delivery man delivering some kindness as well as package. David Sears is here to deliver some other morning headlines. It's all about the Christmas season? Yes, sir. All right, we'll get to that in just a second. First, let's start with this. The search for survivors continues while the death toll continues to rise from those tornadoes that ripped through the Midwest over the weekend. As of now, 88 people across five states have died, as we mentioned earlier, the most in Kentucky, and much of the death and destruction came at a candle factory in Mayfield. As it usually happens, heroes are born out of tragedy. This time, no different. There are hundreds of heroes doing what they can to continue to search for survivors and help clean up and get people back on their feet. One of those heroes, Navy vet Adam Slack, who rushed to the scene of the candle factory right after that tornado ripped through it. He wanted to do whatever he could to help. It was horrific. Uh, if I talk about it a little bit too long, it, it, it'll bring tears to your eyes. Um, it's a community that's very close. Uh, the wind was still going, power lines, there was a couple gas leaks. Um, people everywhere. Uh, it looked like a mound of ants when you kick it over. Everybody's just trying to help, trying to get in and, and get people out safely. Uh, very dark, uh, eerie. It was, it, was, it was bad. There were a lot of people screaming in distress. Um, we were, I was lucky to get one lady out and uh, got her back to my vehicle, uh, gave her some shelter, blankets, kept her warm till we were able to get her to her father, a uh, local lady from Paducah. Um, but uh, a lot of it was a blur. Um, it, it was just, it was chaos. Uh, people obviously lost their lives, family members touched in this community, and uh, just trying to continue to, to support where we can. Can only imagine. By the way, there are some reports, even from some of the workers, that they heard the warning sirens 30 minutes before the tornado hit, and they wanted to leave that candle factory, but were told they would more than likely be fired if they left during their shift. Eight workers were killed when that tornado hit. All right, let's take it to Portland, Oregon. This is a security camera at the home of Miriam Sierra, and that's an Amazon delivery driver bringing a package right there. But look what he's doing. The wind came through and knocked a lot of the uh, Christmas decorations over. So uh, he thought he would help out. Started picking up some of the decorations and putting them back where they were. So they're getting them to stand up again as well. And he makes room for the package and then he steps back. Yeah, it looks pretty good. He likes that. He gave himself a thumbs up. And then as he's leaving, he waves at the camera. So there you go. Thank you. Here's your package and here's your decorations all stacking back up. I just want to say thank you so much. She went above and beyond and I really appreciated it. If I could have seen you out there doing it, I would have went out, probably give you a hug or, you know, I wish I could at least give you something like a bottle of wine or something. I um, just really appreciated it. It was super, super nice. Hey, it's the holidays, the guy delivering packages and some kindness.
And finally this morning, another World War II veteran celebrating a birthday, Jack Holder turning 100. He flew over 300 missions as a naval aviator and was able to take another flight in a classic aircraft in Phoenix recently. He is a Pearl Harbor survivor. He was 19 years old when the attack occurred at Pearl Harbor. He also became a commercial pilot after his stint in the Navy. Looked pretty comfortable in the cockpit. Even when he is on the ground looking up, he's pretty comfortable about it. I feel like I'd like to do it more often. If I'm on a golf course and I see a plane come over, I can visualize everything in the cockpit. Yeah, Holder was able to make it back to Hawaii a few weeks ago for the ceremonies of the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And we found out two things that you might not have known about him. He's a great pilot and he plays golf. So there you go. That works. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, I mean, it, 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 why not? If he's a, a skilled pilot, he's got to probably be a pretty good golfer, pretty good golfer too, golfer. right? Yeah. yeah. But I like how he said he, you know, he wanted yeah. to do that all the time. So yeah. you can tell he plays golf because he's always looking up from the golf course. Yeah. So you there figure, you go. You know. All right. Well, I'm glad he was at Pearl a couple weeks ago for that big Absolutely. anniversary. Yep. David, thank you very right. much, thank sir. You. Right now, 909, about 63 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA at 9. Good morning, I'm Max Massey, and we are sharing the shoes this morning. Take a look. We got it all in. We got everything from Crocs to Coach. We're going to give you an inside look at the count in just a bit. This essay Salute holiday greeting is brought to you by the Republic of Texas Window Company. Hi, this is Sarah with Republic of Texas Window Company, and I'd like to wish the military, veterans, and first responders a happy holidays. Welcome back. We've talked about this often lately. A good pair of shoes is something we often take for granted, and so many children in San Antonio, for them, that need is quite real. KSAC Community is partnering up with San Antonio Police and Good Samaritan Community Services. The shoes are in, and Max Massey joins us live from Public Safety Headquarters as the count of donations begins. And Max, what does that turnout look like? Yeah. Guys, we are counting, we are sorting. Take a look. We got piles and piles, hundreds and hundreds of shoes. The Christmas music is on, the count is underway, and it really is so emotional just looking at the hundreds of donations. Joined here with Officer Cokerham. So when you look around and you see the piles of shoes, what does it mean to you? Yes, sir. So we're out here in partnership with Good Samaritan, and thankfully with this amount of shoes, we're actually able to impact and assist in helping these students and these young people, uh, but not just that, with Good Samaritan, we're helping anywhere from infants all the way to um, the elderly in places where they wouldn't necessarily have shoes. Now, why are you involved? I mean, why do you get involved with this? Why is it important to you? On the base level, I'm with our SAFE unit, so we assist in all community engagement aspects. However, personally, I have had a lot of interactions with the community where they do need shoes, where they don't have any or I don't know why they are walking in these because they're so tattered. So it's a personal thing for me. I want to be here. I want to make sure we can get as many out to these kids as possible. Okay. Uh, you know, specifically, you, you told me before you might have like a, a personal story uh, that resonates with you that really inspired you to come help share the shoes. Do you mind sharing that? Absolutely. So around this time last year in the Christmas, we were doing an event and I was able to make it out to our medical center area and we were delivering packages for underprivileged people and during that I was able to speak to a family and they had a young daughter who was unfortunately very sick and they had moved to San Antonio in the medical center area specifically to get her treatment at um, one of the hospitals there so unfortunately they spent most of their money they didn't have Christmas the kids barely had any um, clothing other than a few days worth to be able to get to school and even then sometimes when it got bad they weren't even able to do that so able to walk in bring them both presents as well as some shoes like we did this year the smile on her face it's something that'll stick with me for years to come all right officer thank you so much thank you sir appreciate, appreciate it time. And guys we are far from done coming up at 9 here we're gonna have a full count see how many pairs of shoes were able to be donated and we're gonna speak with someone from good samaritan talk about how you can still help out back to you guys we look forward to it. Thank you, Max. Thanks for the update, Max. 915 already warmed up to about 63 degrees outside. Have we seen significant rain on radar at all this morning, Justin, or has it just been kind of been like, eh? Eh, pretty much eh. Uh, th there are some showers out there, but they're really light, and most of that's east of San Antonio. So as far as measurable rain this week, 
don't see that really happening. It's not until Saturday that I think we actually will get some rain in the rain gauge and we need it. It's been like something like 17 days here in San Antonio since we've had measurable rainfall, so we could use it. Uh, let's go and look at the fog and the visibility right now. We'll start with that and visibility is down about a quarter of a mile in places like uh, Randolph, uh, New Braunfels, Seguin, down about half a mile at the airport. So we're seeing some minor improvement here, but it's going to be slow to happen. And it'll probably take until 10, 11 o'clock before you see this fall completely go away. Places like Rock Springs, the visibility is down close to zero. And this is widespread, so it's across much of our area. Dense fog advisory is in effect until 10 a.m., so another 45 minutes or so. And that's where visibility underneath that advisory is where visibility can be down to a quarter of a mile or less. Looking at uh, the satellite and radar here, I mentioned those showers. There you go. Some of those moving up through the Cuero, up towards uh, Gonzales area, lifting north. We're not seeing any returns here around San Antonio. But that being said, there is drizzle out there. I mean, it's going to be sort of damp. There could be some wet spots on the roads. And as you know, when it's been dry for a while and you get just that light coating of drizzle or rain, it can make the roads pretty slick. So just be careful and looking outside. Uh, we're looking at 63 degrees at the airport and we are reporting some drizzle there, calm winds. And uh, as we look at the month in review, December so far, it's been well above average. We've had one day, one day, that was Sunday, where we were a little bit below average. But in general, we've been about 9 degrees above the average, the warmest being 83 on December 10th. And we're projecting to be above average all this week until we get to Saturday. So what a warm month it has been. And you look at the numbers this week. 80 degrees Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That's close to some records before we get the cool down Saturday and Sunday with a cold front. We'll talk more about that in just a second. 63 Kenyon Lake, 62 in New Braunfels, 63 Rio Medina, 61 in Bandera. Some 70s on the map as you get down towards Victoria and Corpus Christi. So it is a warm, muggy morning. Dew points are in the 60s. That is definitely muggy. That doesn't change much. We'll get up to around 75 this afternoon. There could be a few breaks in the clouds, but we're not looking for much. So it is going to be a, a mostly cloudy to cloudy day. Futurecast. First initial front gets uh, into Texas on Thursday. I don't think it gets far enough south to really have an impact on us. So we're going to ignore that front. But the secondary push of cold air comes in on Saturday morning. With that, we get a line of showers and storms initially. That uh, pushes through, and then behind it, we'll get some overrunning. So we'll continue to get some light showers, maybe a few rumbles of thunder, Saturday into Sunday before this uh, system moves away. So in general, the weekend looks damp, it looks cold, cloudy, you name it. Good weekend maybe to stay indoors and uh, watch some Hallmark movies, or at least that's what Mike's going to be doing, right? <laughs> Uh, 80 degrees Wednesday, 80 Thursday, 80 on Friday. There's that cold front. 60% chance of rain Saturday. Temperatures tumble into the 50s. It'll be windy. Still some showers lingering on Sunday before it all clears out. Monday looks beautiful. We'll be up around 64 and sunny. guys. Uh, I know that sounds like a lot of private information about Mike, but he's pretty public about right. it. He is. Right. He, he loves for the Hallmark network and, and the movies this time of year. And Christmas in general. I understand. I understand. Justin, thank you. See you in a bit. 919, about 63 degrees. And coming up on GMSA 9, we'll take a look at what's behind the historic price hikes we're seeing on nearly everything. 922, the Federal Reserve holding a key two day meeting this week to discuss interest rates and inflation. It comes as Americans are paying for more for nearly everything, including rent, gas, and food. New data shows consumers are seeing the highest prices increases, rather, price increases in decades when it comes to groceries and restaurant meals. In today's Consumer Watch, CNN's Jen Sullivan takes a look, a closer look at what's behind those historic price hikes. Dining out or dining at home? No matter the option, most Americans are feeling the pinch. New data shows groceries and restaurant prices are the highest they've been in decades. These are what most people spend most of their money on. So when there's even a few dollars of a price increase, it makes a big difference in the average person's pocketbook. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, restaurant prices spiked nearly 6% over the 12 months ending in November without seasonal adjustments. That's the largest 12-month increase since 1982. What that means is that people are not going to be eating as well. They're, they're certainly not going to be eating out as much. And if you thought you could save more by cooking at home, think again. Grocery prices are also at record highs. They jumped more than 6%. 
the largest 12-month increase since 2008. Beef had the most dramatic price spike at nearly 21 percent. You're seeing prices in grocery stores go up. Most people spend the majority of their money on rent, food and fuel. And so when those things go up, it really hurts. The hikes in food are part of a bigger trend. Consumer price inflation, which includes gas prices, rose by 6.8 percent in the 12 month period ending in November, hitting its highest level in 39 years. It's the worst inflation that we've seen in three decades, so it's bad and it's really unusual. It's the Federal Reserve's job to fight inflation. In this week, there's added pressure on the Fed to take action during its scheduled two day meeting. For today's Consumer Watch, I'm Jen Sullivan. Supply chain and labor pressures are also contributing to the price increases across the board. Restaurants, food manufacturers and grocers are all facing higher costs for items like labor and transportation. As those costs rise, manufacturers pass some of them on to their retail customers who in turn charge consumers a portion of those increases. In other consumer news, the Senate is set to raise the national debt limit today. They will use a special one-time process created specifically for this vote after Republicans insisted Democrats raise the limit on their own. The process will allow them to do the simple majority vote, which they can achieve without any Republican support if every Democratic senator signs on and Vice President Kamala Harris casts a tie-breaking vote. It's not clear how much Democrats plan to raise a debt limit, but it's expected to be enough to ensure the issue doesn't come up again before next year's midterm elections. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned the federal government could begin defaulting on its financial obligations tomorrow if no action is taken. American Airlines says it's aggressively hiring workers to keep flights operating on schedule. Executives from American, Southwest, Delta and United are set to address a Senate Transportation Committee tomorrow. American CEO submitted testimony that says the company is trying to prevent a repeat of all those fall flight cancellations. Staffing shortages caused similar scheduling meltdowns for Spirit and Southwest Airlines this year. And time now is 926 with a lot more ahead on GMSA at 9. This holiday season can be difficult for deployed service members and veterans in VA hospitals, but a local nonprofit is hoping to brighten their spirits. Coming up, how they're bringing holiday cheer one stocking at a time. Also coming up next, how local recovery center is helping people learn to deal with the stress of the holidays on top of their mental and health and addiction issues. The pandemic has in many ways intensified mental health and addiction issues, so gathering together this holiday season may be tough. And that's why a local recovery center is holding a class to help families plan healthier and happier holiday get togethers. Our Courtney Friedman shows us how to be a lifeline for those in substance abuse recovery. Well, drug addiction was a, um, just kind of took over my life. Alex, who only wanted to use his first name for the story, moved to the sober living facility at Blue Heron Recovery at the Los Patios campus in San Antonio, a public sober community with restaurants, shops and services, a safe place that may be stressful to leave for holiday gatherings. Sometimes when you get sober, um, the family dynamic doesn't know where to go and um, the holidays can be very triggering for a lot of people, especially when it's the first time many people are gathering together since the pandemic hit. So we're all going to sit home and stress and worry. Should I go? Should I not go? What happens if Uncle Bob's there and he's throwing back vodka? And Blue Heron Recovery Director Christina Varela Mayer says that's why for the first time they're holding a holiday survival class open to the public. But it's just an open, fun honest class about how we can communicate with one another, support one another, and enjoy the holiday as much as possible together. The main lessons being communication, boundaries, and preparation. My mom's really excited about coming. Yeah. Alex hopes others in the public will see how helpful this class will be. I'm excited in learning in this class is how to kind of embrace your, your dysfunction and learn how your family dynamic works and what we can do to make that the best we can. The holiday survival class will be here at the facility December 15th at 7 p.m. There will be food and drinks and also life changing conversation. From Blue Heron Recovery, Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And taking a look outside with a live can, we had a foggy morning. It still kind of looks that way. Uh, we're at 64 degrees, not as cold as it was this weekend. No, and in fact, we're going to see those morning lows stay right there in the 60s, even upper 60s to the end of the work week. So it's going to start off rather warm 
Obviously, it's going to be fairly muggy, and we're getting some of that fog and the drizzle this morning, so it's just in general damp. We'll see more damp mornings down the line, too. Let's go outside for you. Whoa, did you see that? See the bug? No, I missed <laughs> it. I missed nice, it. Nice bug. It really right off the screen right as you guys looked up. Uh, uh, sure it did, Justin. Yeah. <laughs> Someone out there saw it. It wasn't just me. Uh, cloudy skies, and uh, we're looking at temperatures right now at 63 degrees, calm winds, and that fog still sticking around. Dew points are very high, and then there's a look at the visibility. Uh, right now at about half a mile, Stinson, Port SA, at the airport, same for Randolph. So it's pretty widespread here around Bear County. As we zoom out, we're still seeing some fog out around Rock Springs and Eagle Pass, too. Temperature-wise, 62 in New Braunfels, 63 Canyon Lake, 63 in Divine. There are some light showers east of San Antonio. And temperatures today should warm up to about 75. Despite the cloud cover, despite the fact we won't see much sun, it'll still be a warm day. East southeast chilly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. It will not be a warm day on Saturday. Again, you know, we've got a big cold front headed our way. Another look at the weekend forecast in just a bit, guys. Thank you, Justin. The pandemic continues to take a toll on educators, leading many to call it quits. Now administrators for San Antonio area school districts are taking action to entice their teachers to keep showing up to work and for new faces to join. Alicia Barrera was at the Edgewood ISD teacher job fair yesterday where pay raises and sign on bonuses were the key. I feel like the pandemic increased the stress level of everyone. A stress that has led some teachers to leave their classrooms for good. I've never found this to be an easy, easy job. Um, it's always been challenging. So what has these educators in line for a new teaching opportunity? You know, the fear of, of the children falling behind. I really feel like it's important that we invest in children and it's hard to do that outside the classroom. Mr. Campos would agree. He's back in the business of teaching after 10 years in retirement. I was a teacher for 27 years before I retired. But this time around, new hires are getting sign on bonuses and current employees a pay rate, all in an effort to fight the teacher shortage. And at Edgewood ISD, there are more than 30 teacher vacancies. We have a $3,000 sign-on bonus um, that is valid through January uh, 31st, 2022. At Edgewood, the bonuses are for new full-time hires, but substitutes can also start cashing in this spring. Last month, SAISD's Board of Trustees voted to increase daily pay for substitutes up to $225, depending on the subject, days, and grade level. Harlandale ISD also announced it would increase its retention stipend for full-time employees to $1,000 as a thank you for their effort and time to carry out their duties. And at Alamo Colleges, students in the Educator Preparation Program are getting offers even before wrapping up the program. I have never had so many principals call me before at the beginning of the school year looking for teachers. They're hiring them on emergency permits. And just so you get a better idea of how eager these school districts are for hiring new faces, during Edgewood ISD's job fair today, within one hour, at least one teacher was hired on the spot. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Or for some military members, the holidays mean spending it without their loved ones. But this Christmas, a nonprofit is hoping to brighten the spirits of deployed service members and veterans. Soldiers, angels are stuffing holiday stockings that will be shipped to service members deployed to combat zones as well as veteran patients in VA hospitals across the country. Our Tiffany Huertas joins us now live from Soldiers Angels where volunteers and staff are stuffing stockings. I was a part of this group of volunteering many, many years ago. Tiffany, I love what they do. How many stockings are they sending out this year? That's so awesome. Yeah, everyone here is so nice and so happy and in the spirit of the holidays this morning. They're going to be shipping 40 thousand stockings this year just check it out as staff and volunteers are here filling the stockings this morning these serve as a reminder for active military and veterans that they haven't been forgotten and to talk a little bit more about this is president and ceo of soldiers angels amy palmer good morning talk to us about this whole initiative this whole program and did you all reach your goal Good morning. Thanks for having us. Um, we actually did reach our goal. We're sending about 42,000 total stockings. We've already shipped all of the stockings to deployed service members that are due to get overseas in time for the holidays. And most of the rest are going to guard reserve units that are activated and deployed or, or veterans that are hospitalized over the holiday. Talk to us about these super cute stockings. What's going to be inside there? Well, the great thing about this program is they're unique to whoever built them. So people go to our website and pledge a certain number of stockings and then we give them a list of recommendations 
recommended items that they put in them and they pack them. So every stocking, every, you know, every stocking they use, everything inside of them are all unique, which is amazing. And volunteering is behind all of this, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So people pledge the stockings and those are all volunteered and, and USAA actually gave us money to do 7,000 stockings for deployed this year. But all of these are individually pledged and then we have volunteers in here that are inspecting the stockings to make sure there's nothing in there that they can't have overseas and then um, counting them and sorting them and to get them ready to ship. What is the reaction like when people get these? Well, for service members that are deployed, sometimes this is the only thing that they'll be getting, especially if they don't have family back home. And to get an unexpected box right in time for the holidays is really kind of great. And it's unique and unexpected. And sometimes it's what they need just to get over that hump and get through that kind of holidays. You know, people are a little depressed going through the holidays in a deployed location. And veterans that are hospitalized over the holidays, you know, some of them don't have family, especially the older veterans. And so for somebody to come by and give it to them, it really is special. There's also an event happening later this week. Talk to us about this food drive. Yeah, so we do a monthly mobile food distribution in six markets and one here in San Antonio every month. And we'll be giving out to about 20,000 pounds of food to 200 veterans, and including a holiday turkey that we've purchased for each veteran. So it's a great thing. In two hours, we serve 200, over 200 veterans. Amazing. People can still sign up for January because December is full, right? For veterans to get food, it's full. It fills up in like eight to ten minutes when we open registration. But we can, you can still sign up to volunteer on our website for the food distribution to serve the veterans. And you can still sign up to volunteer to pack stockings. And that's what it's all about. Just everybody coming together this holiday season and volunteering and just giving back to our community. How does it feel to have these programs here in San Antonio? You know, it's awesome. I mean, of course, this is our national headquarters, so we ship all over the country from here. And, you know, people are just so supportive. The volunteers that come in every day, and many of them are regulars. We have people just wander in and pack for a little while and leave. It's just amazing, the, the support of the local community. I'm so excited to keep talking to everybody here. Everyone is so excited this morning, and we're going to have all that information on KSAT.com. Back to you guys in the studio. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, through the month of November, we asked for shoe donations to help out local families in our annual Share the Shoes initiatives. And we partnered up with the San Antonio Police Department and Good Samaritan to help get as many donations as possible. And today is a day to count. Max Massey joins us live from Public Safety Headquarters. And Max, do we know the number of donations right now? We do know the number, but take a look. We have everything. New Balance, Vans, even look at these guys. Oh. Tiny cowboy boots. We're in South Texas, so it makes sense. I'm going to put this back because they have been sorting all morning. Everything very organized over here. Joined here with Alejandra from Good Samaritan. Good morning. So when you look around, you see all the shoes. What does it mean to you? I think it means definitely a burden lifted off of our family's shoulders, especially with the holidays and the financial burden that, that brings. Happy faces all around. Now, we were talking about the final count. Do you guys have a final count? Yes, it's just over 1,600 pairs of shoes. That is amazing. So what does that mean for your charity, your philanthropy? It means a lot. It means that every single child that comes through our doors is going to get a pair of shoes. We serve about 2,000 individuals annually. So definitely we'll see a lot of kiddos running around and wearing their brand new shoes. That is awesome. You guys have been helping families on the west side for how many years now? 70 years. 70 years. So the need is real here in and around community. Definitely. Um, we serve families and individuals of all ages and all stages of their life, starting from preschool to our youth and teen programs. And we even have a senior center. Now we are doing the count and share the shoes drive today. But if anyone missed out through the month of November, how can they still help out? They can help us actually by donating or volunteering. Right now, we just launched our end of year campaign. We're celebrating 70 years, like we just said, and celebrating unity in the West Side by visiting goodsamtx.org. All right, Alejandra, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And guys, if you have any questions, how to donate, if you still can, we're going to have all those answers. Just head to ksat.com. We're also going to have a lot more coming up on the news at noon. Back to you. Look forward to it. Thank you, Max. Well, folks, the days are going by fast, about 11 days till Christmas. If you need to mail out any gifts that you want to arrive in time for the big day, here is a latest look at the shipping deadlines. The, it's important to note that the U.S. Postal Service, UPS and FedEx all have different deadlines and mailing options. Most of the deadlines are coming up tomorrow, December 15th. Also, the deadlines for USPS and the continental U.S. is continental U.S. That does not include Alaska or Hawaii shippings. If you have mailings out to anything in those states, there are different deadline dates. You can find all this information online at ksat.com.
And so far, so good for holiday deliveries. The analytics firm Ship Matrix says both the post office and EPS improved on time deliveries in the first major test of the season. The two weeks after Thanksgiving, FedEx though dropped in on time performance compared to last year. I was at a UPS store last Saturday. There was a long line, but in and out of there like that. Oh, good. Yep. That's very encouraging. Getting it done. 942, about 64 degrees. And you're watching GMSA at 9. The state of California making some changes to help fight climate change. Coming up next, what new requirements they're implementing for food scraps and how you can make some changes here at home. A law goes into effect in California next year that requires the state to reduce organic landfill waste. It comes with requirements about what to do with food scraps. So people who live in Sacramento likely will be able to throw them away with their yard waste next summer. Sarah Costa has more details on the changes. Some old eggplant, a moldy pomegranate, lemongrass and some old rice, the ends of some cabbage there, and all of these are going to go into our compost system. The list could go on over organic waste products that'll end up in this homegrown compost. And again, 95 degrees. Where these scraps go next explains the why behind the new law in California to prevent climate change. For a lot of folks, this would go into the trash, and when it goes into the trash, it goes to the landfill, which actually creates methane. Methane, a short-lived climate pollutant which is 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. The city of Sacramento plans to roll out the organics recycling plan next summer, but the start date may not be the same as other areas. Changing the way we do things ever so slightly to have a major impact on the fight against climate change. California businesses have to start recycling organics as soon as January, and commercial housing units like apartments also have their own timeline. This is what some gardeners would call black gold. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. And if you would like to learn more about composting here in San Antonio, you can contact Solid Waste Management and ask them about the organics program. Justin's back with a look at our forecast and an update on our fog situation. Still there, still there, but it looks a little bit better. You know, it's going to be slow going, the, the improvement, but uh, we're still seeing some uh, fog as we look out on light cam. It just looks maybe a little less foggy, if you will. Uh, temperatures this hour, 63 at the airport, 65 Stinson, 64 Kelly, 63 at Randolph, calm winds. Two point temperature close together it was a great setup for fog this morning and uh, that's why it has been so widespread. We've also noticed some showers uh, drifting through our eastern counties. This is all pretty light rain, but moving south to north. So Goliad, Yorktown up to Gonzales. That's where we're seeing the rain right now and it'll continue to track north towards the Luling area, probably staying out of San Antonio. But with that being said, we've got drizzle out there just because it's not showing up on radar doesn't mean it's not damp out there. Some wet roads in and around town with that very light mist and drizzle. Visibility down about half a mile throughout most of Bear County. We've got some fog out west, two places like Del Rio and Eagle Pass reporting fog. A little bit of a break from Hondo to U Valley, but then it picks up again. And Gonzales now down close to zero. Uh, New Braunfels, quarter of a mile, so it's still pretty thick in spots. Again, there's the scene outside 63 at the airport with some drizzle, 62 New Braunfels, 63 Canyon Lake, 64 in Comfort, 60 in Del Rio. What a mild start. These temperatures are well above average. For low temperatures this time of year. And as we look at the dew points, uh, they're going to stay high all the way through Friday. Saturday, they fall off with our cold front, and we'll get some much, much drier air in here by the end of the weekend and into early next week. As far as temperatures go today, we're thinking 75 here in San Antonio. You'll see some warmer numbers down to the south, a little cooler in the hill country. And then tomorrow morning, only down to 66, so not a big cool down. And then we may make it up to 80 tomorrow. It all depend on if we see a few breaks in the clouds, which are possible. If we do, then those temperatures will really crank up and we'll be near some records. There's a look at the satellite picture. A lot of clouds, good blanket of clouds. It's going to be hard for these to break up today. So it's going to be cloudy with maybe just a few peaks of sun here or there. And then you see some of those showers as we showed you earlier. Big picture, I want to take you out west. A lot of unsettled weather here. Snow across the the mountains and then a lot of rain as you get into parts of California. This is a first piece of energy that will move through and then there's another piece behind that that will move across the country and that's the one that will push in some of that cold air by Saturday, which I think we're all kind of ready for, right? Uh, here's a look at the forecast for Thursday. That's that initial front. Doesn't really make it down here. It doesn't do much for us, but it's that second push and this is Saturday at 7 a.m. We've got a line of showers and storms along this front and then behind it much cooler, windy, cloudy 
We'll still get some showers. I think some overrunning through the day on Saturday and probably through most of Sunday too before this finally clears out Sunday night and we get some sun early next week. So here's how it looks in the seven day forecast. 80 on Wednesday, 80 Thursday, 80 on Friday. We get close to some of those records and then plummeting temperatures on Saturday with the front. We fall into the 50s, maybe even 40s by the time uh, we get to the evening hours there on Saturday. 50 on Sunday, 40% chance of showers and clearing on Monday, 64 guys. A lot of changes ahead. Thanks, yes. Justin. Mm -hmm. 10 till about 64 degrees. And another chance for you to get your COVID vaccine. Lilla Pharmacy will be hosting a pop-up clinic at the Antioch Sports Complex on E. Ross Street from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. The Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines will be available. They will also offer the Pfizer vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. And we'll be right back. And welcome back. It's 953. The city will be ringing in the new year in person this year after a virtual celebration last year because of the pandemic. City officials are excited to announce that the city's New Year's Eve party will be in person and at Hemisphere. The event is being put on by the San Antonio Parks Foundation and the party will start at 6 p.m. on the 31st. Admission is free. So besides the fireworks at midnight, there will also be a carnival, food booths and musical entertainment. It's almost game day. Spurs are back on the court tomorrow night. The host, the Charlotte Hornets at the AT&T Center. Tip off is set for 7.30 p.m. And a quick look at the roads with Transguide. Looking at I-37 at Fair Avenue. Things look good there as well as at Hot Wheels. Still fog though. Yeah, murky, murky, a little bit wet out there. We're going to still see some drizzle this morning. We'll actually see that next couple of mornings. So expect some damp mornings and then mostly cloudy to cloudy afternoons. It's warm, though. We're near 80 through the end of the week before our big cold front on Saturday. Big article on KSAT.com today. Return of the Jedi and Selena are among the numerous films that have just been added to the National Film Registry. Yeah, so the Library of Congress announced that films including Star Wars Episode 6, like Mark said, Return of the Jedi, Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, and A Nightmare on Elm Street are among the 25 movies tapped for preservation this year. And of course, uh, Selena, like we said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, uh, Jennifer Lopez starred in that 1997 biographical film. And uh, Cicely Tyson Sounder, uh, made in 1972, also made the list. The library said this year's selections date back nearly 120 years. That's right. The oldest was the Ringling Brothers Parade film in 1902. The library has selected movies for preservation because of their cultural, historic, and artistic importance since the registry began in 1988. This year's pick brings the total number of films in the registry to 825. Oh, wow. Uh, let's see. The Return of the Jedi, Fellowship of the Rings. Uh, that got uh, public support through online nominations. Uh, two animated features also made the registry, including Pixar's Oscar winning film from uh, 2008, WALL-E. We may remember that one. Okay. And then one called Flowers and Trees, a Disney film released way back in 1932. Wow. I hadn't heard about that one. The mm -hmm. one from 1902. 1902. That's mind <laughs> I have to look that one up. The Ringling, yeah. Ringling, Ringling Brothers, Brothers Parade, Parade film. film. That one's probably hard to find on streaming, isn't it? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> you guys have a great day. Netflix, call us. <laughs>